Today, I'm excited. We have Jason Edwards from Texas. Welcome to the podcast, sir. Thank you, Blake. Glad to be here. I'm excited to chat with you. I feel like I've been following you on LinkedIn for half a century. Jason Edwards, he's got 25 years of experience in cybersecurity, risk, and compliance. He holds a CRISC and CISSP certification. Uh, he's an Army veteran. For 20 years, he was a cybersecurity officer for the Army. Respect, sir. Uh, he's been a professor of graduate level cybersecurity courses at multiple universities. He's an author of books and newsletters. He's a speaker. He's an amazing LinkedIn content creator, 69,000 followers. Uh, he's led teams at Argo Group, Brace Industrial, USAA. He's currently serving as a principal of regulatory insur assurance for Amazon Web Services. He's on a mission to empower organizations and individuals to protect their data assets and customers from cyber threats. Welcome to the podcast, sir. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. How should we kick this off? You know, I was watching your YouTube video earlier and you like to help military veterans transition into careers and it may be even cybersecurity careers. So we'll chat about that. Anything else you really wanted to cover today? Well, I, I think I think that's one of the key things in, in life, right, is to have some kind of thing that you focus on and that you volunteer for, right? And so I do a lot of, I don't want to say consulting, but mentoring, right? So I, I provide mentoring services. I'm going to start a, a monthly, like a mentoring group for veterans and everybody else going into cyber. I love being in a classroom where I have a 30, 40 people who have never even heard of cyber. They've seen it on TV. They saw the ad. They, they come to the classroom trying to decide if they want to be cyber. And then you start teaching them just a little bit at a time and you see their minds opening about how exciting of a career this can be. And, you know, you change people's lives. Right. And I think that's something, you know, it, there's not really a lot of things you can take to the grave, but you can take the fact that you've touched a lot of people's lives. And I think that's kind of one of the missions that I have, right? Either making you laugh on LinkedIn with some goofy video that probably skirts the LinkedIn terms of service, but if you get rid of it there, but, um, but also, you know, just meeting all of these folks and, and giving them a different trajectory. Well, respect to you for that. I'm sure so many people appreciate it and probably hundreds and thousands of people that you'll never even know about. So uh, kudos to you. A warm up question for you. What? is your favorite Star Wars movie or show and why? I have enjoyed Star Wars my whole life. Ever since I was a little kid, you know, we were we were very, very poor. And so I never got to see Star Wars at all originally. And I never got to see A New Hope until, you know, we were at one of my richer friends' house who had HBO, right? And this is like the <laughs> early 80s, you know? I went over to their house and I got to see Star Wars on HBO, you know, as a kid. And it was just the most exciting thing I'd ever seen in my life. And I think the very first movie... Well, the second movie I saw in a movie theater, first one was uh, Beverly Hills Cop, believe it or not. It was a duplex with uh, The Adventures of Remo Williams. So the, the second one I ever saw, there was Empire, right? I got to see Empire Strikes Back in the movie theater. I think the greatest thing is watching my kids go through their Star Wars phases, right? So I have four children. I have a, you know, two older ones, right? One just got out of the military and he's going to go to school in Chicago. And I have two younger ones, right? 12 and 14 right now. So dial back a couple of years to when my son was younger, it was everything Lego Star Wars and watching Star Wars for the first time. So I got to experience it again, especially the prequels through his eyes, right? When he was little. Well, fast forward to the new trilogy and I got to watch it through my daughter's eyes, right? As they got to go through it and see Rey as the Jedi. After all of this though, I think honestly, it's either later Clone Wars TV shows, right? Like season five, six, and of course, seven that Dave Filoni did the animation. But I really like Rebels. You know, I think Rebels is a fantastic story. And of course, anything with Ahsoka or when Ahsoka comes back, her trajectory, I think is probably my favorite. But believe it or not, I like Rebels. I really do like Rebels. Yeah, I've watched some of the Rebels and, you know, the Bad Batch is on right now. I don't dig the animated stuff as much as like the live action, but I still, I like to follow it just so I can see where the story's going. And know kind of what's happening in the universe. Uh, you know, I've got small kids too. My daughter's six and I've got twin boys that are four. And they've got Darth Vader figures and stormtroopers. And they know all the characters. And we read books to them at night, you know, about their Star Wars books before they go to bed. And yeah, I just I just love everything about it. I think one of the things about the animation that always gave us to us, and up until now, Disney just started the live action. So if you wanted hours and hours and hours of content from Star Wars, it was animation, 
right? You know, the right. Filoni verse or whatever that you had. You know, now of course you get the Mandalorian TV show. We we you know okay we got Boba Fett, but we're all kind of mixed on that one, right? But you know you're starting to get hours and hours of live action content in Star Wars, which just wasn't possible, you know, 10, 15 years ago. It was animation, or you just rewatched the movies. Yeah, I'm a big fan of um, Rogue One and the Andor oh, series. Have you yeah. seen Andor? Absolutely. I, I think I mean they got great actors in it. It's well written. I'm really upset there's Very only well. two seasons for it. <laughs> I figure we could get seven out of that at least. You never know what Disney's going to do. They might change their mind and have a third they might wait 10 years and come out with a third season of andor who who knows <laughs> well, I, I think the problem has always been with dizzy is that they always focus on you know the wizards running around with laser swords right so you got to be this exceptional individual who can use the force and the great thing about rogue one and andor was that there are so many stories that can be told about people who don't use the force right just like and andor is like an everyday story you know rogue one is just a bunch of everyday people you know it, they don't have magical abilities and I think Star Wars sometimes over focuses on those who don't like the Bad Batch season two is probably the best, most dramatic animation I think that I've ever seen because it deals a lot with like PTSD and veterans issues. And if you're a veteran, I mean, season two of Bad Batch and season three, I, I've not watched. I'm going to binge it when it finishes. But season two of Bad Batch is not is all about people coming out of war and what are they going to do in the peacetime? Right. Which is and they use it through the lens of a clone. Right. And how they deal with it. And that is not a story about, you know men and women running around with laser swords, right? It's it's a very down to earth kind of discussion. And I think that's, you know, I think that benefits Star Wars. I don't know if Disney really appreciates that as much as they do. Yeah, there's so many parallels between the these Star Wars stories and real life. That's that's what I love about it. Hey, can we talk about social media for a minute, LinkedIn? Sure. You share a ton of content. I love your stuff. You, and you've got a lot of followers, almost 70,000. Do you have like a well-defined social media strategy that you follow or are you just kind of trying to find something that keeps your attention every day and share that for the longest time it was just having fun on linkedin right you know what i mean you're just posting wacky videos and stuff and then one of the funniest things was that one day I, there was a senior executive at a company I used to work for and he's like jason i really love your content on linkedin and i was like really i was like i just posted a video of like two airplanes <laughs> you know it was like it had nothing to do with cyber and he's like, yeah, I, I really enjoy, you know, it just, it takes kind of like the load off. And so what I've always considered it to be is like, I'm the water cooler person on LinkedIn right now. I do post a lot of cyber stuff and I'm starting to really get into more of a strategy with how I post it. And three times a week, I do little two minute cyber, you know, so you can just digest it real quickly. And I'm going to turn those into videos here shortly, like blogs. But I, I think the great thing about it is that you can do that and you can do other stuff. I, I think the biggest compliment about LinkedIn was they cleared off all inactive accounts like a couple months ago, and I lost maybe 2,000 out of 70,000 subscribers. So I know there's at least 69,000 people who are actually watching what I do, which is kind of, you know, it's kind of heartening. But I think as I move forward, I'm going to start with more of a strategy. I think I've been a content creator for LinkedIn for about two years using their tools. Now they're opening them to everybody else where you can post in advance. I have not branched out to things like Twitter or, or other areas, right? I've, I've really been kind of focused on LinkedIn mostly, but I wrote about it in a new book too. One of my books that I wrote is actually for cyber people trying to get jobs in cyber. And it has a chapter on exactly how to do your LinkedIn, right? On how to, how to make it more impactful. Yeah, you, you do a good job. I mean, people are looking for a distraction from their day to day, right? I mean, it, the weirdest stuff keeps people's attention. Like I posted one this morning. I'm in my in my office here doing an exercise as Darth Vader. And I bet that's going to get more engagement than the podcast clips that I put up. And that, that was the whole you know goal behind starting the podcast is to create content for the target audience that I'm going for, the ICP, as opposed to making silly videos for the recruiter community. You know, it feels good. A lot of likes and comments. It does feel good. But when you take a step back and you're trying to do something more strategic, like a podcast about a certain subject. And now I'm finding that when I'm posting clips, the engagement is super low on the serious stuff that I think is really adding value. So, uh, you know, I'm kind of conflicted now. Uh, I guess you just kind of have to mix it up a little bit of serious, a little bit of silly, and you never know what's going to work. And I would say one thing too, is don't get disheartened when people don't click like on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is more of a, you know, straight laced kind of community. There's not a lot of hearts and likes and, you know, I'll, I'll post a video. It'll get 600,000 views and maybe 200 likes. You know what I mean? So 
you can't really you can't judge your content on LinkedIn by likes or or any of that. Also, it's just there's different videos will get shared more than other videos. Serious videos people will watch, but on LinkedIn, but they're not going to like it. You know, they they won't click like. It's just not what people do. Like LinkedIn has definitely has a very very different feel from other social media communities, right? Whereas Facebook is all about likes and why didn't you like this? And or Instagram, why didn't you like my Instagram? Right? No one says on a LinkedIn. I never walk out and go, hey, what's up? Why did you like my LinkedIn post? You know what I mean? It's, but you can see the views, right? And, and the analytics. And that's kind of what tells you what the engagement is. Yeah, that's true. Now that I think about it, I have noticed my follower count going up a lot faster. Even though the engagement is lower and the viewership is lower, the follower count is going up. So um, I guess that's happening behind the scenes. You don't really even know about it because they're not, you're right. They're not liking, engaging. People are just watching it. Talking about your background a little bit, can you just dive into your, story for a little bit and and kind of tell us how you landed in the cybersecurity space. I think I always liked computers. When I was a kid, it was an escape. So I grew up in an inner city and we lived in a project. <laughs> so, you know, being in the library or being in the lab and stuff like that was kind of more, it was safer in a lot of cases, right, than it was. And so when I was little, the lab was a bunch of Apple IIEs and I, and I learned to program on an Apple IIE. Matter of fact, my first program was a choose your own adventure. Uh, Because I really liked choose your own adventure books back in the day. And so I wrote a basic program that just did the same thing. You know, if this go to, you know, the really basic, basic kind of Apple IIe commands. And so since then, I've always had a love of computers. When I joined the Army during Desert Storm, it was like 91. You couldn't get a computer job in the Army. There was none. It was, you know, infantry, artillery, armor. You got to pick those kind of jobs. And so I did, right? So, and I did that for about nine years as enlisted throughout the army. And then I got really lucky and I met this person named General McChrystal, who was the commander of the Ranger Regiment at the time, who is pretty famous at this point in time. And he recommended me and a couple other officers recommended that I go to officer candidate school. And so again, going to officer candidate schools enlisted, you only get to choose armor, infantry, artillery. You don't really get a lot of choices. So I ended up with armor, which is the M1 Abrams, the tanks, and you probably don't see them because they're on the other side of the room. But um, I did that for about three or four years. I commanded in Afghanistan, and then I came back in the Army and said, hey, now that you have a computer degree, we have this thing uh, that we're trying to start, you know, basically cyber. We called it computer network defense back in the day. And so I started off with that. It was just a dream job at the time. I got to do it. I did that for about another six, seven years, two deployments to Iraq, uh, one in Baghdad, one in, one up north in Kirkuk. And it was exciting. It was fun. You know, I mean, aside from the fact that you're in the army, you're serving in combat, and there's a lot of excitement there. But being able to have a job where I knew this translated directly into my civilian career, right? Or, or especially with veterans now, right? Hey, that's fine. You may be out there in artillery. But start thinking about the fact that soon you're going to be in the civilian world and no one's going to say, hey, here's your tank, right? That's, you know, IBM is not like, hey, we have all these tanks. We just don't know what to do with, but please come work for us, right? So I think that helped me translate over. And then when I got, when I left the military, I retired at the military here in San Antonio, Texas. I just started working for civilian companies one after the other, right? I just, I had a great person who hired me at, at Argo Group named Sunil Punjabi, a fantastic person who gave me a shot. And then I had other jobs as we go forward. And now I'm working with just an amazing amount of people. Like, you know, it's just surprising every day to go in there and to see what people do at Amazon. But I think you got to have that long-term kind of goal on what you want to do, right? What do you want to be when you grow up? But don't be so overly focused that you understand that you're never going to get the dream job every single time you try, right? I tell my students, you know, hey, that's great. You're going to do a year's worth of cybersecurity training. You're going to get out. You're going to say, I am totally qualified to be a pen tester. But I only got to work in a SOC, or I only got this job is available to be on the help desk over here. I call those dream adjacent jobs. You know what I mean? Sometimes you got to get dream adjacent before you get to your dream job. So, yeah, I, I, and that's kind of how that story went on how I think cyber, it's just where I want to be. It's challenging, right? By the way, except for the military, where else, where else do you get to say that you fought off the Russians on a daily <laughs> basis, right? Like, what do you do today? I prevented an attack from Iran. You know, I mean, that's what my students get to say, you know, and I, I think that's fantastic. Yeah, you're making a real impact out there. You're a great role model for anyone who's, you know, transitioning out of the military to civilian life and trying to fall into their career. What advice are you giving folks who are entry level or transitioning to make them more eligible for cybersecurity jobs? I think one of the small little tidbits we teach at, at a couple of the universities I work 
work with is this thing called imposter syndrome, right? Where you never believe what you did was worth it and you always are doubting yourself, right? And I, I have it. I think everybody has it to a certain extent, right? I think the one thing you'll see a lot of people, especially people coming out of the military or people switching from jobs, like I've had chefs, I've had Amazon delivery drivers, I've had FedEx delivery drivers, I've had caterers, you know, uh, lawyers, all kinds of people trying to change their roles into cyber come through my classes. I've probably taught a couple thousand students, you know, over the years. And it's the exact same thing that I see with every one of them. Hey, I'm an ACE certified mechanic, but now I want to be cyber. Who's going to hire me when I've spent the last 15 years working on cars, right? And the one thing I tell everybody out there is that one, don't get imposter syndrome and don't feel like you're not good enough because, well, guess what? You know what employers really want is they want a person who comes to work. They want a person who's dedicated. And you have years worth of dedication and experience that you can point to. Yeah, it's not in cyber, but the fact of it is that you showed up fixing cars for 15 years means that I know you're going to be here in cyber and, and you're going to learn, right? So I think one thing is that people need to stop worrying about what they've done before, what they're going to do in the future. Don't have imposter syndrome and learn to be a little bit more self-promoting, right? The military has this, and this is even today I get told this and it's kind of weird if you look at my LinkedIn, you're like, oh, this guy promotes the hell out of himself. But like in the military, we're always told never to take glory, right? For yourself, right? It's the team, it's the group. I didn't do it alone. You know, all of this in the civilian world, it's a lot of it different. You know, you've got to take, you know, credit for what you do. You've got to be a little self-promotion. I think that's the hardest thing for a lot of people to learn is how do we get from, I'm just a member of a team. And now I'm like, no, I'm the greatest cyber person and you should definitely hire me. How do they get from there to that successful interview is a process. Imposter syndrome is a real thing. I mean, we're all kind of just faking it, I think. Um, we feel like we are. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think I've never heard anybody say this, but are we all just pretending with positivity? Is that, is that what well, we're doing? <laughs> so look at it this way, right? If you pretend to be a thing or you're thinking that you're pretending to be a thing, let's say I pretend I'm going to be a very happy person all day. To myself, I'm telling myself I'm going to pretend to be happy all day, right? Am I happy? In, in all extents and purposes, with all outside evidence, with people looking at me, the way I act, the way I am, am I a happy person? Yeah. I'm actually a happy person. What the problem is, is that in my brain, I'm telling myself, the little voice back there is telling myself, you're not really happy. You're just pretending you're happy. But I'm doing everything a happy person would do, right? That's imposter syndrome. And it's okay to have a little bit of check on your ego. What you don't want is get to a point where that overrides your ego, causes self-doubt, anxiety, depression, and you get into that spiral where I'm not good enough. Every and, and here's the thing too, is what the problem that a lot of people have is, Blake, is that they think it's just them, right? They think it's just them. Oh, it's just me. I'm the one doing this. No, every single person on the planet out there, unless you have no ability to second guess your own actions, like you have no conscience, you have imposter syndrome. Everybody does, right? Because we have a little person in the back of our head trying to bring us down to reality. But that's what makes us good people, right? All the people that you look at and go, those are horrible horrible, vacuous people do not have that voice in their head telling them, I don't think you're good enough, right? You know what I mean? So if you have a voice in your head telling you that you're not good enough, you're just normal. And it's okay to have that voice in the back of your head, right? Don't let it, don't let it run your life though, because you'll never take chances. Right. Yeah. I try not to take anything too serious and, and I try not to take myself too serious, but I do try to think about how I can add value and just make a positive impact somehow, however I can, right? And if I think if you do that, you're going to be okay. <laughs> oh, I agree. I, and I, look at what you're doing now. I mean, you know, Star Wars is something that brings people from all walks of life, all, I mean, countries, races, creeds, whatever. We all love Star Wars because we see it in ourselves, right? We see the ability to do something so amazing. And I love it when people talk about Star Wars because I don't care who you are. Like I was in a KFC one day waiting for my car camera to put in. And there's two gentlemen next to me talking about Star Wars. And all I wanted to do was like, oh, my God, you're so right. Rogue One is a great movie. And then you start talking to two absolute strangers, but you have one thing in common and you become friends. Right. Star Wars is what allows people to do that. Right. You know, you go to these conventions or you see Star Wars conventions and nobody goes nerds. You're like, that is an excellent costume. How much time did you spend on that? Right. You know what I mean? You can be two. One person can be a lawyer. Another person can be an auto mechanic. And you have something in absolute common that you can talk to each other with. And I think that's amazing. Agreed. Before we hit record, you were showing me some of your background there and uh, your plans for Star Wars Legos and you got Millennium Falcon ships. They're not all staged, but we'll have to have you back whenever it's complete. And I'd love oh. to talk to you again. <laughs>
Yeah, I, I, I've run into a problem when my son was little. This is about, you know, 2005, 2004, 2005. He loved Lego Star Wars. And so I would always buy him Lego Star Wars. And I was deployed a lot, right? So, you know, you, a lot of it's guilt too. But, you know, he had a constant stream of Lego Star Wars. Well, the funny thing is he got out of Lego Star Wars and I didn't. I'm always like the middle-aged guy in the Lego store when, when people are looking and I'm like, I'm always giving you advice. Like my favorite dad advice. Do you want to hear my favorite dad advice in the Lego store? Please. Buy the keychains. Here's what I always tell people with young children. Buy the keychains. Little kids love the Lego minifigures, right? I got about, you, know, you can't really see them. There's going to be about 192 of them up there, but they always fall apart. So you end up with like your son's running around with like Darth Vader without a helmet because he can't find the helmet or one arm is missing, right? The keychains can't come apart. So all you have to do is use wire snips and cut the keychain off and they'll have a little stud on the top, but the keychain minifigures don't come apart. So they're great to give to kids because they can play with them all day and the legs, the arms, the helmets, they're not going to fall off of them. So there's my, there's my dad advice right there. Yeah. Good advice. I have to check that out. A lot of times I'll, if I have a lunch meeting or something that I'm going to a happy hour, I'll come back and some of the items here in the office have nice. been moved. You know, I'm like, okay. I, I, <laughs> I think I know who's been in here. <laughs> yeah. You know, I remember um, I went to first tour in Iraq, my second deployment. I had uh, the Lego Star Destroyer, right? You know, I'd saved up for a very long time to get it. And I got it. And I came uh -huh. back and there's like a hole cut in it. And my son was, I was like, and I was like, oh man, no, there's no minifigures in this one, right? So I ended up, we went out and got him the Lego Star Death Star when it was at the time. And so we spent like the next three weeks together putting it together. Legos is, is such an incredible bonding experience with your child. And and I just, I never got mad. The greatest thing too, people are like, oh no, did he break your Lego? And I'm like, it's a Lego. <laughs> There's nothing you can do to it that can't be put back together. But even if they did, right, you know, um, especially when he's little, you know, oh, he broke something. I, I always thought to myself, it's plastic. You know, yeah. and you know the feeling as a parent, you're like, a kid could break everything in my room and I'd be okay. <laughs> We'll, we'll get over it, um, especially Legos. You can't get mad over Legos. It's something like the Death Star, right? It probably took hours to complete so if you like we did a little bit at a time so we didn't get frustrated over a couple weeks yeah so if that gets destroyed it's like oh <laughs> well you know now he's 25 and it's in a box in my storage unit he's like wait i still have that i'm like of course i kept it for yeah you. i'm not selling that <laughs> no way it's in a plastic container with all the spare parts that have fallen off of it right you know that's my problem right now is i have a storage with probably three or four hundred lego sets that are in there and so if you live in the san antonio area <laughs> If you have kids, I'm going to start getting rid of them shortly. So, because I've decided everything's got to go in here or I'm going to start making a whole bunch of little kids day, you know, by handing out Lego Star Wars. So. Text me photos. You yeah. might have a buyer. <laughs> so you did warn me that we could talk about Star Wars for the whole, you know, 90 yeah, minutes. I apologize. Uh, yeah. yeah, no, it's all good. I, I'm guilty of it too. We need to make a different podcast, you know, Star Wars opinions. There's a lot of those already, but. <laughs> yeah. Well, some people take it way too seriously. Like I'll watch one and they're like, Disney is doomed. And I'm like, calm down, man. <laughs> calm down. It's a TV show. Whatever you do, don't watch Robot Head. He's uh he's funny. Oh, it's hilarious, and he's right. But he's like, oh man, I didn't even see that. I wish I hadn't watched. But he's I hate that he's right. <laughs> yeah. Well, and a lot of times people just like like someone will say something about a trailer. Oh, this trailer, like the acolyte, is getting a whole bunch of grief right now. It is. And I watched it, and I was like, it's fine. <laughs> it's like you know, people have different versions of Star Wars. I don't have to watch them all. I may not like them, right? You know what I mean? But I think anything you do in the Star Wars universe enriches it. I think a lot of people nowadays, they're very scared of the, you know, you'll say the woke, you know, some people say woke, some people won't, right? Or, or the ideology. And they'll, they'll see what they want to see in a TV show. It's a confirmation bias. If I'm very anti-woke, let's say, and I, and, I, and I expect Disney to be woke, then everything I see from Disney will be woke. Right. Yeah. You know what I mean? I will find something. And, and it's funny. And the commentators, right, Blake, you know, where they, especially the ones that are, you know, I, I'd say overly invested a lot of it, you know, take it for what it is, right? It's enriching the Star Wars universe. You may not enjoy that part of it, but it's still, there's stories to tell and everybody should have a story. Like these are all different people's ideas of Star Wars. And the great thing about a universe like that is that it exists. It's wide enough for everybody to have their opinions and their thoughts, right? And again, like every other consumer, if I don't like that candy bar, I just won't buy that candy bar. Yeah, I mean, I'm pretty easily entertained by anything Star Wars. And, you know, I try to put myself in their shoes. They are a big company trying to appeal to a very wide audience and be inclusive. So bless their heart. It's not a bad thing, right? You know what I mean? It's like, you know, it's okay to have different characters in there and to have different stories. And I think that makes it all for the better. I mean, it does. My, 
I mean, look at like, um, you know, the, the one movie that everybody talks about about it, which I think is absolutely unfair, which is Solo, which I thought was a fantastic movie. I love Solo. I, I, the problem is it came out six months after Jedi, and we're all like still trying to brush our teeth over Jedi. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, oh my God, what did we drink? You know, um, but Solo was a <laughs> fantastic movie with horrible marketing. You know, I, I talked to a couple of people after it came out and I'm like, hey, you're going to take your kids. And he's like, it looks really dark. And I was hmm. like, that is a horrible trailer. And I looked at the trailer and I went back and I was like, yeah, it does not look like any other, you know, the last Jedi was way darker than solo. You know what I mean? And, oh, yeah. and just the way they did the advertising and, and the, the, the screw ups with the directors and stuff. But that is an amazingly diverse movie and it is fantastic. I think again, too, people, what people do is they, they hold on to something that's very near and dear to them, which is good. Like star Wars was a core identity of mine when I was growing up. Right. It was, Hey, I'm this poor kid and these people are doing amazing things. You know what I mean? And I want to be like that, right? I kind of joined the military for part of it because that was the way to get out and do amazing things at the time, right? In this little town in Illinois. It's okay for them to continue with that, right? And it's okay for stuff that I may not like for them to do, but it enriches everybody and it and someone will like it. And if some little kid out there looks at it and says, that could be me, then I don't care how many millions they spend, it was worth it. I think the greatest example of this is Jar Jar Binks. <laughs> when, I will, um, when I look at Jar Jar Binks, I was like, oh, my Lord, you know what I mean? Like, goodness, what was what was the guy thinking when he wrote this character? My son loved him at the time. Right. Like, you know, over the years, I kind of mellowed on Jar Jar Binks a little. And then I watched it all over again with my nine year old during the pandemic. And she loved Jar Jar Binks. And I'm like, you know what? He's a genius. The guy, <laughs> he wrote this character like a, he's a literal genius. Like, I don't know how, but George Lucas was able to connect with nine year olds better than I could with my own nine year olds. You know what I mean? And so, but you, but you look at all the ridiculous hate that like Ahmed Best got for playing that yeah. role. He did a fantastic job, you know, and, and that's really, I'd say the kind of toxic part about Star Wars we have now. Of course, what you'll see is Star Wars will get bad ratings. They're like, oh, it's the toxic fans. You know, I, I think we all kind of, you know, the, the company overdoes it on that one. But I think at a certain point, it's okay to say this is a good movie. It's just not my type of movie. Agreed. Yeah. And I'm still waiting, by the way, for Solo too, because oh, I don't know where, what's the female character's name? And she takes the evil guy's oh, oh, ship and goes to see Darth Game Maul, I guess. Yeah, from the yeah. Game of Thrones, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, about, yeah. I, yeah. know where she went and what's going on there well i the loved her was, character and they had ray park as darth maul the guy who does the voice right like he was fantastic that was the best live action and he had the legs you know by the way i'll get yeah. it out here real quick but if you're a star wars fan you know about the legs right you know about the you know uh -huh. but also i mean look at anything filoni touches is gold the fact that we're returning to you know the witches of dathomir in the ahsoka tv show like the whole time i'm like oh my god the seven seasons of clone wars is paying off i understand every reference here and he's still coming up with new stuff right you know what i mean like oh I, solo should have had a sequel it was fantastic i think there was star wars fatigue from releasing two of them they should have waited till the fall like every other star wars movie comes out in december but they were overdoing it and that killed off the boba fett movie which may have not been for the best might not have been for the worst if you look at the series right i think it was a fantastic movie i think it got shortchanged uh, everybody woody harrelson the guy who played han solo which, by the way, is in Cocaine Bear. <laughs> I was watching Cocaine Bear, the movie, and I'm like, why is he so familiar? And I'm like, oh, my God, that's Han Solo. <laughs> I know he has a real name, but people, his name is Han Solo. Now. Yeah, he'll always be Jun Han Solo Jr. Okay, uh, cybersecurity talk. What, well, let's do that. Okay, helping people transition into cybersecurity careers. A lot of people, their first thought is, oh, what? certification should i get what's the first two or three that you would look at if you were trying to break in yeah and when i explain it to my students i say there's there's certain certifications that are the they're the equivalent of you must be this tall to ride right you know what i mean like the signs of six flags over here and i would get to say i would say that's the security plus the comp tia security plus is the one certification now cyber security is like any other career Right. You know what I mean? So there, there's entry level certifications that you're going to get, like your mechanic is going to be ace or something similar. Right. But in Star Wars, it's going to be security plus. But then security plus is a generic kind of certification. Like it covers almost every domain of cybersecurity, but at a little bit. Right. Just to make sure that you're competent on a lot of little different areas. Right. But it all depends on and what I say is what you want to be when you grow up. Right. So it's a lot of my cybersecurity students want to get into what I call technical cyber. Right. There's two types, technical, non-technical cyber. Technical cyber is I want to be a security engineer. I want to write code. I want to do vulnerability assessments. I want to um, do pen testing, ethical hacking, red team, right? A lot of those kind of technical 
kind of areas where they're hands-on keyboard for a good part of the day. Um, those kind of certifications, then you need to start looking at what is your second certification going to be. In cyber, you usually have one or two, right? Usually two in most cases. So uh, you'll say, okay, what is my second certification going to be in? If it's technical cyber, there's an entire uh, set of them out there. Um, and again, not to plug my book, but I did, I, I wrote a couple of books on this topic. One of them is about how to become cyber. And it's got a listing of every single career in cybersecurity with a listing of certifications that go with that career. And they're all available on Amazon now. I went through a period of layoff last year. So for several months, I had nothing to do but write. And so I took on writing books and I've, I've released four of them are with the publishers now. Two more are coming this year. So one of them I wanted to write because of my passion dealing with students, right? So definitely you want the security plus, and then you want to decide technical or non-technical. I'm more on the non-technical side. So I have the two higher level certifications. One is a CISSP, which you get after a certain number of years that you've been in cyber, and a C-RISC, which is a risk and compliance certification. And the reason I'd say entry level versus career wise is because there's a cost associated with the certification. So certifications are like a plane ticket. You don't pay for the cert, you pay for the opportunity to take the test to become certified, right? So a CompTIA Security Plus is about 300 and some bucks, right? That's not a small chunk of change. However, a CICP is like 800, an ethical hacker is like 1,000, you know? So you take this certification first and then you decide what that second one is gonna be. But there is definitely a monetary penalty if you don't pay attention, if you don't study, if you don't focus on you know, the certification that you're going to get. Good advice. And I like that you are saying, take the first one and then decide which direction you want to go from there. You know, a lot of folks on YouTube will say, get the CompTIA A plus certification, but I wonder if that's even relevant. I don't know how relevant it is to your day to day, especially like printers. Like if there's questions there about printer troubleshooting, it's like, I don't even want to know the first thing about printers. Why do I need to take this? <laughs> yeah. When I ran security and infrastructure at that energy company, it was a lot of printing, believe it or not, but like, but no, 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 let me, explain the difference between the three basic CompTIA certifications, right? Because these are very old certifications. Like I took the A plus in like, you know, 20 years ago, right? It's been around that long. My, my CCNA was 20 years ago. 20 years ago, we only had a couple certifications, right? CompTIA has been around for a very long time. One of the oldest, most respected vendors that are out there, period. They have three basic certifications that are really considered entry level that I'll talk about. One is A plus, the other is net plus, and then security plus, right? A plus is for what I call desk side. These are the men and women that suffer through our, our problems at Best Buy. When we go in there, right, you know what I mean? You go to the Geek Squad, this is their certification. And in a business, this would be the help desk person that comes to your desk, right? This would be the person that comes out and solves problems with you on the help desk, right? That's what an A plus is really for. So you have two parts to it. You have a hardware software part, right? Hardware, of course, is all the little, you know, and like you said, printers and, you know, SCSI cards and all kinds of stuff that's, that's really not going to be relevant to day-to-day -day cyber. I would imagine. Um, and the second half of it is operating systems, Windows, Linux, Mac. Not really a certification I'd recommend for a cybersecurity person. If you're getting into IT and you want to work in a help desk and you want to get your career started, definitely A plus is something that you should look at. The second one is net plus. That's for entry level networking people. And there's really only a couple of comparisons out there. There's like the CCNA uh, for the Cisco side, which is much, much more difficult to get and requires vendor specific knowledge, right? So CompTIA in general is what we call vendor agnostic. It's not focused on a specific technology, right? So they're not easier, but they're easier to understand, right? It, not easier to get, but easier to understand. Network Plus is for people who want to work in networking. The next one I would say is the Security Plus, which is our entry level for cybersecurity. So yeah, you'll see other certifications out there. And there are companies out there who are just dedicated to generating certifications. And I won't mention who they are. You know, you'll see a lot of these, especially come through in emails, become PowerPoint certified. Is that necessary for you? No. How do you know what is going to be necessary for you? Go look at job descriptions on Indeed, Monster, LinkedIn, and look at what certifications they're asking for. Now, one of the things I talk about, I also have a hiring book for if you're a hiring manager, right, or you're an HR person, how to hire cyber, because a lot of the mistakes I see, especially in jobs, you know, they'll like, they'll say, hey, I need a CISSP is the certification we'd like you to have for this entry-level cybersecurity job. They don't realize you have to have five years of experience. And that's an $800 certification to get, but they don't know, right? And so I, I did, in one of my books, I literally wrote this so that they can understand that. You Jamie, know, pull that the, book up yeah, and you're pretty sure the choir here. <laughs> oh, sorry, yeah. Because <laughs> that's the problem that you'll have, right? Is that, you know, the HR folks will go out there and they don't know they're doing their best, right? But they're not cybersecurity person. Another thing I tell students too is that, and, and you got to understand this when you're looking for a career, job descriptions are rarely written by cybersecurity people. They're written by, you know, human resources, talent acquisition. And those are the first people that you're going to talk to 
right? They're, those are the first people that are going to look at your resume. So a lot of the resume advice I give in the book and in person is that you don't write your resume for a cybersecurity person all the time. You write it for an HR or a human resources or a talent acquisition person who's going to have to read it to try to determine it, right? So most companies, for example, the hiring manager never sees the resumes that come in. Like, you know, you'll send, you know, you know, oh, this job position got hundreds and hundreds of resumes that are attached to it. But the hiring manager will see four or five. Well, who does the sorting, right? Well, that's going to be talent acquisition. That's going to be HR. And there's a lot of reasons they do it. One is for bias, obviously, right? Others is to make sure that, you know, that's kind of their job is to sweep down the pile of 400 resumes into a couple that are focused on this one. One, writing resumes is kind of an art form on how you need to take care of it. I spend a lot of time in the book talking about it. You brought up a good point, though, about how hiring managers will see only a small fraction of the people who apply because there's, you know, folks who are screening the resumes and they are HR people. They're not technical. And right. that's oftentimes that's a big frustration of mine whenever they're the gatekeepers for resume submissions, because sometimes I feel like it's their lack of knowledge that will prevent them from like seeing the same things that I would see in a resume and why it would be beneficial. Maybe it lacks a certain keyword, but it's synonymous with like 10 other things on their resume. And yeah, they didn't put it on there. But if you just send it to the hiring manager, somebody in cybersecurity, they would know that. But to some HR people, it's black and white. And it's just so frustrating. Even if you have the skill set and your experience is perfect for the role, the hiring manager may never even see your profile unless you play the keyword game. I think the keyword game in government jobs, absolutely, especially when there's a computer. And, and a lot of times if you submit it to Workday, there's going to be keywords. So what really happens right behind the scenes is that a hiring manager will say, hey, I need a person with these skills. So they'll write the job description, they'll put it out there. Now, to be fair, HR and talent acquisition, they're rarely dedicated to just cyber, right. Right? unless you're in a very large company, right? And then those folks become very experienced with how to handle these kind of situations. In most companies, I'm gonna say like 95% of every company that's out there, that person is, okay, for five minutes, he or she is hiring a cyber person. And then five minutes later, I need a warehouse manager. And 10 minutes later, I need an accounting, you know, accounts receivable person. So it's an incredibly difficult job what they do. And, and you're absolutely right. They're not going to get it right all the time. We don't get it right all the time. And I, I just do one job. So they'll get a list of all the key things that the hiring manager, hey, I'm going to talk to the hiring manager. going to say, I need these four things. Okay. They're going to put them in the job description. If your resume doesn't have those somewhere near the top, where they can look at it and go, okay, got this, got this, got this, got this, got this. Okay, that one's good. I'll send it through. What a lot of times people do when they write their resumes is they make two fatal flaws. And I talk about it in the book. The first fatal flaw is they use the same resume for every job, right? I have one resume. I'm going to use this resume to send out to every single job, right? The problem is, is that those 10 words here are not the same 10 words over here. And if your resume doesn't have those 10 words, then the person's literally just going to go, I doesn't just, you know, Jason doesn't qualify for this job. So he, his resume won't get screened. So what they need to do when you write a resume, I always keep like a little section on mine. I talk about it right up the top where it's got some keywords in there. I just literally put those words in there. Oh, strategic thinking, uh, strategic thinking is going to go right in this little box. You know, you're not trying to get through the guardian, right? The HR or the TA, don't think of it as like a firewall that you're trying to break through to get there. Think of it as like the first test on whether or not you're paying attention to getting this job. Those keywords are going to be some of the leading indicators of what that resume, what that interview is going to look like as well. But remember, resumes don't get you jobs. Resumes get you interviews. Interviews get you jobs. I tell people all the time, your resume is a brochure. It's an ad, right? Yeah. And if you're not showing the customer what they're looking for. They're not going to click buy now. I'm going to share my resume template somewhere in the notes. I'll share it with you too, Jason. I've got sure. something that seems to be helpful. And I've even got a version that I made for a uh, stormtrooper. So it's like it's nice. Star Wars related, but it's kind of gives you an example of, okay, I see what's going on here. I can relate this to any career path. I'll send that to yeah. you and attach it somewhere. You've spoken a lot about the skill set shortage versus the demand for cybersecurity careers. And, and you had said this in your speech a year ago, uh, or at least on YouTube. Are you still seeing the same thing in the market in 2024? I do. I think we all do, right? The one thing about cyber is that it is changing, which is very hard for people to kind of keep up with. So I tell people there's a lot of what I call core skills that'll never change, right? So it's good to have some technical core skills. I think, for example, when I got selected to become this computer network defense person, right, I went to a year-long school 
for officers at Fort Gordon, Georgia. And the very first two classes I had was the CompTIA A+, and the Cisco Certified Network Associate. Now, the A+, didn't really help me out quite a bit. You know what I mean? It was that big of a deal. But the CCNA did. The networking did. If you're going to be technical cyber, understanding the network, and in, and in a lot of the classes I teach, especially with Thrive and North Carolina State and stuff like that, the very first course they're going to get is networking. It's a fundamental skill, right? So there's certain skills in cybersecurity that I call fundamental, right? And understanding the network is one of them. Do I think you need to be certified in networking? No, you do not. But I think you need to understand networking skills, right? So there's quite a few of those out there that I would say is, you know, what are the fundamental skills? And do you know those in order to move on to build that base? as you go forward. And I think that's one of them. Okay. So current affairs here, it just in your opinion, what are some of the biggest challenges facing the cybersecurity industry lately? Well, one of them, I think it's the economy is hurting a lot of folks because you saw cybersecurity. I, I think people always need cybersecurity people. It's just a matter. So, so let's look back at some of the major challenges we had in a couple of companies, right? Look at Equifax. One of their biggest challenges was people. They were losing people hand over fist. And, and of course, one of the biggest you know structural problems they had is they weren't identifying their processes and having people in to you know document them. And of course, you know when people would switch over, they'd get another person who didn't know what the other person did. And the turnover was so fast it led to the actual problems, the technical problems that caused the the big issues at Equifax. Right? Fast forward all the way to something like Colonial Pipeline, where they had had a position open for a director to do cybersecurity for a very long time, but they were lowballing. And what you're starting to see now is the you got to be in this area to work here. One of the problems we have with this whole RTO push is that now you're back to where you were in 2017 or 2018. If I need a person to do this job, well, I need them to be here in the city. Well, now you, you, you restricted yourself to two things, either one, the candidates that are in your city, right, or near you, or people who are willing to move. And that's not a lot of people, right? You know, we have kids, we have families, we're not moving in a lot of cases. So now you restricted your talent pool to only people within driving distance of your office. That is the current challenge I think that companies are facing, right? Not just the, hey, okay, at least now we know we need to pay them more if we're going to get the candidates. Now we want them to move into our cities. Now, unless you're a very large company and you're, you're, you know, you're paying really, really well, people will move for that. But if you're just the regular company that's out there and you're trying to struggle to have a cybersecurity person, you're either going to take what you get in the local area or people that will move there, or you're going to either have to look at some kind of remote option or raise the pay extraordinarily well and try to convince people to move to your city. You know, and, and this is not a, a dig on any specific city out there, but I remember when I got out of the army, I had a very generous job offer from a company in a very big city that I did not like. And, and, and it was like, wait, you want me to move there? You know what I mean? Like, no, no, I'm in Texas. Why would I move there and pay taxes and do all these other things, right? I, I think that's where companies are going to struggle right now, especially especially with this. They're pulling back from this, allowing people to work remotely, where in, in our case in cyber, what I do from my house and what I do in your office is no two different things, right? It, it's it's not that I'm in board meetings about finance or I'm doing these other things. It, it's, it's mostly technical cybersecurity that I could do from anywhere in the world. And if you're a smart company right now, allowing these people to work remotely uh, is going to pay off dividends from you. Because now, instead of saying, hey, I need only talent that exists in San Antonio, Texas, I have the entire country to look at. So the person you may want, you know, I'm in San Antonio, a company in San Antonio, but the person who has the best qualifications for this job is in Hoboken, New York, but she can't move. Well, that's okay. <laughs> Because is there any really substantial difference between what she would do inside my office in San Antonio and there in Hoboken? And in cybersecurity, majority, 99% of the time, the answer is going to be no. There's no difference, except that you'll have a happier employee, you'll have a more qualified employee, because your pool is now the entire United States, not just San Antonio, Texas, or people who would choose to move here. Yeah, no doubt. Now, I see that day in, day out. And it's been very frustrating. The market's pretty awful lately. I mean, the return to office situation is, uh, it, it just makes me want to want to cry. And these companies, they're now thinking they're going to become you know, dependent on relo candidates and we, we'll find somebody who can relocate. Well, what about the terrible home purchasing conditions with the high interest rates? No one wants to sell their home where they've got a two or three percent interest rate and get into a seven and a half percent mortgage. And then although companies should be paying a premium for, you know, a huge premium for these on-site workers who 
you know, they think are going to relocate. We're seeing salaries coming down. Companies are putting out these take it or leave it deals, giving low ball offers. It's just a bad combination. And we're seeing the remote first companies are definitely winning right now. And as an agency recruiter, I'm seeing a lot less uh, volume of job orders only because with all the layoffs going on, it floods the market with candidates. So then you get HR folks who can just post a job, get 500 applicants in three days, plenty of options to choose from. They don't necessarily need a headhunter right now to go find people because they're all over the place. And I get day after day people getting referred to me for jobs. Hey, I was just laid off. Hey, I'm looking, you know, my company's going through some uncertainty right now. And I don't have anywhere to send these people. It's sad. So it's only temporary. You know, these conditions can't go on forever, but it is a tough market for a lot of people. And I hope the layoffs are going to end soon because boy, it's, um, it's been a bloodbath. I, I think the other thing too, is you destroy loyalty, right? You know what I mean? The way some of the companies are acting towards their employees in general, and this is not about a specific company. It's just in general. I think the employees that the companies that do well, build that loyalty within themselves, right? You know what I mean? And so, you know, through thick or thin, we're going to be here together. The problem that you have with people is, let's say I have a family, you know, I do have a family. Let's say you offer me this fantastic job. I move there and then I see you laying off people all the time. Wait, I'm going to move my family to a new city with the possibility that I may lose my job a year later. You know, that's the problem that you're running into now. And so people will accept lower positions locally right? If they can only get a local job, they'll accept one locally and they'll do what they got to do versus, you know, be happy and be more productive, right? You want employees that are productive. You want employees that are happy. You want employees that are going to go that extra mile without being asked, right? Versus I think the situation that a lot of companies may be finding themselves in here shortly with this kind of short-term attitude between it. I, I think, you know, this is a typical economy where it's, it's an employer's market, not an employee's market, but like everything else, it's going to change, right? You know, the one constant about the market is that, you know, the economy is that it'll be different. But looking at specifically about cybersecurity, you don't hire cybersecurity because they're putting widgets on an assembly line, right? You know what I mean? You know, I need seven more people to do widgets, six more people to do widgets. Cybersecurity is like insurance. You know, if you look outside and you go, oh, it's sunny, I don't need as much hail insurance today. You do that? No. <laughs> of course not. Why? Because the weather changes constantly. The fact in cybersecurity that there are new attacks, new laws. I mean, let's just look at my specialty, right? Which is laws and compliance and regulation. That's not going down. <laughs> you know right. what I mean? Like it is not going down. The United States has a, a singular problem where we don't have a, a national cybersecurity law, right? Where the Congress has not gotten together, you know, God help us if they ever, but they've never gotten together and passed a national privacy or a national cybersecurity law in the United States, which according to the U.S. system, right, is every state's for themselves then. So you're looking at 50 new cyber laws, 50 new privacy laws, 50, you know, over and over new laws that are coming out all the time. That is not a good thing for company and companies who are going to find themselves in a situation like an Equifax, a Target, a Colonial Pipeline, right? Or, or just the myriad of small companies that are out there that get hit every single day. There's one, two, three million cap companies that are out here getting hit with cyber attacks daily that don't make the news except for locally, right? We had a movie theater chain here that we all, you know, they have an announcement. At least they have not, but we all believe it was cyber. But that was kind of devastating locally. But that's not making Fox News or CNN. You know what I mean? So companies thinking, oh, I don't see as much in the headlines right now. They don't have the right perspective mm -hmm. on all of this, right? You don't get insurance. You don't get hail insurance on your house because, you know, it's sunny most days. You get it for that one time in the four or five years you live there that it's going to be catastrophic. Yeah. And it's funny you bring up the insurance analogy because, you know, I'm hearing companies just in general, they're just sinking a boatload of money into cybersecurity. And it's like playing whack-a-mole. You know, you think you got all your bases covered and one pops up over here and there's something novel that comes in and like there's no amount of money that can protect you from these phishing campaigns and constant barrage of cyber attacks. So they're just like, instead of investing more money into their cybersecurity teams and their tools and such, they're just buying cyber insurance or increasing their coverage. And that's really not going to work. <laughs> so what you're finding out with a lot of cyber insurance companies, look, insurance companies just in general aren't stupid, right? You know, I mean, if you're if you're a car driver who keeps getting into accidents, are you going to have your insurance long? No, right? 
Uh, is, is your car insurance going to pay for everything? No, right? You know what I mean? Insurance companies, and this is just in general, we're, we're capitalism, it's been around for 200 years, stop complaining, it's, it's just the way it is, right? But insurance companies don't survive by paying all the claims. So the, what you're seeing now in a lot of cases is insurance companies, they will write so many things into their in cybersecurity insurance writers that if you fail to do any of those things, they can walk away. Now, five, six years ago, cyber insurance they, they were just written poorly on behalf of the insurance provider, right? Hey, if anything happens, we'll cover you because, you know, it's cyber. We don't know anything else about it. And boom, $100 million ransom or $10 million ransom or $5 million ransom. That is not the way cyber insurance is written now. Cyber insurance is written now as, hey, are you patching all your systems? Are you doing vulnerability assessments? Are you doing risk analysis? Or are you doing all these myriad of things? And if you come out and have a cybersecurity attack and you weren't doing these, you're not getting paid. The cyber insurance is not going to pay. They're going to walk away from you. And you're seeing a lot of that now with companies who are thinking that it's a magical salve that they buy, which is cybersecurity insurance. And anybody who's ever been in a major car accident will tell you, yeah, that doesn't cover everything. Right. And, and it, they won't cover everything, if, if, especially if you've ever had to litigate an insurance claim on a car. I don't know how you would ever think that a business cybersecurity insurance for $10 million is going to be any less stringent. Right. It's not. It's going to be even more so. So that's not a salve. Right. It's not a panacea that you can apply that will cover you. I think the one thing that we do miss and, and also hold accountable is leadership in cybersecurity. There will always be instances that happen to your company. Let, let's let's look at a different industry altogether. Look at the airline industry you know, Boeing doors or whatever the meme is nowadays, right? The doors fall off of airplanes, even though there's a million <laughs> flights a day that don't have this happen. Right. Well, look at everything. I don't look at a door falling off of a Boeing as the worst case scenario of that flight, right? The worst case scenario of that flight is it doesn't land, right? I was like, there was a comedian who talked about the the miracle on the Hudson, right? Where he landed the air, so he landed the airplane on the Hudson. And the, and the guy was like, this is the best case scenario. And he's like, no, no. The best case scenario would have been arriving at the airport on time. <laughs> like <laughs> this is the best case scenario of one of the horrible things that could have happened, you know, right here. But if you look at an airplane, airplanes are never guaranteed to not have a problem. Airplanes have problems all the time, right? But they don't fall out of the sky because there are so many redundant possible systems, including the pilot themselves, that can save that plane, right? That we pay a lot of money for these highly trained people to do all of these amazing things. Airplanes don't fall out of the sky. There's not been a single airline crash since, you know, the months after 9-11. That's remarkable. 25 years without a single airliner crashing. I think that's just the norm now. Airplanes are really well designed where a catastrophic event like a missile is about the only thing that's going to have to, that's going to be able to do it. But look at cybersecurity. Just because there are incidents in cybersecurity does not mean you don't have a well-defined system, right? The question is, is, is it a catastrophic Equifax target colonial pipeline kind of incident. And, and, and even if you look at those, where those all, you know, I'd say Equifax is probably pretty broad in the things that we did wrong. Target for sure was pretty broad in the things we did wrong. Colonial pipeline was just not really, right? It, it wasn't, it was just a single, it was a billing system. But what they didn't realize is that billing system was a key dependency on pumping gas throughout their entire system. The gas lines were never affected. It was just a Windows server that did their oh, bill, wow. right? Yeah, and that's what took the whole thing down. A cybersecurity leader, if they would have had one, would have done the risk analysis to go, hey, this is a key point in our defense right here. Do you understand what that is, right? In a lot of cases, it's not a matter of, oh, I need less cybersecurity people because I don't see a lot of things happening. If things happen, for example, Equifax, it was a leadership issue. The, the root cause of the entire thing was a leadership issue. Target was a leadership issue, right? And these are cybersecurity leaders. Cybersecurity leaders are going to be held more. I mean, look at, look at what's going on with SolarWinds. Look at what happened with Uber and the CISOs, right? The, the government is starting to look at the leadership versus, oh, did you not have the right software? Because it's the leadership that determines if you have the right software or if you have the right people. So it's not a matter of hiring fewer cyber people. You need more cyber people, but you also need to hold your own leadership accountable. You can't blame the stewardess because the door fell off the airplane while you were flying, right? You can't blame the pilot because the door fell off the airplane, right? Now we're holding Boeing accountable, the people who made the door. That's exactly where the accountability should have been. The problem that you have in cybersecurity, and I, I'm sorry if I keep going on here, is 25 years ago, 30 years ago, if someone robbed a bank, there was a video of it, of a guy with a gun and a mask holding up the bank, right? You did not look at that video and go, it's the bank's fault. Nowadays, if Bank of America gets hacked tomorrow, I'm definitely going to blame Bank of America. Why? Because it's an unknown assailant who did it and they should have been prepared, 
right? We have a much different perspective on the way cybersecurity works versus real life, right? If a person is mugged or their car is stolen, we don't immediately blame the person who got mugged or the person whose car was stolen, right? Because that's not the way victimization works, you know? But if you look at a large company, you can't blame this mysterious cyber group named Panda Kitty or whatever the weird little name we've named them at, like Golden Panda or whatever it happens to be. We, you can't blame them, right? Because it takes years. Do you know who did Equifax? I mean, it took years. It's four generals in the Chinese military who were accused by the FBI of orchestrating the attack on Equifax. It was the Chinese military. But if you asked anyone in the country about Equifax, they were like, that was hackers, right? Equifax doesn't get a get out of jail free card. They try. They've tried over the years. They always put in their like little annual report. Like, by the way, it was the Chinese military. Did anybody tell you this? But they don't get a get out of jail free card for it anymore. Right. It's different when it comes to cyber and your company. If you lowball cyber, if you undercut cyber, if you lay off cyber, if you don't take the best out there instead of what's available in your local area. That's going to happen to you. It's going to happen. And there's going to be no get out of jail free card for it. Yeah, I had Key and Williams on the podcast last week, and um, I've still got to do the clips of our show. But he talked a lot about what you were saying that, uh, you know, these boards and the leadership, they're going to be held accountable for some of this stuff. And it was also said that, you know, if it can happen on accident, which a lot of these things are happening on accident. Then it can happen on purpose. Looking at the the cargo ship here recently that hit the bridge. I can't remember what the bridge is name the, is but the it just Francis collapsed Scott key. Yeah, the Francis right. Scott key bridge. I, I posted that on linkedin and my, my question wasn't why did the ship hit the bridge ships hit bridges that is not a new thing in this country by the way if you google ship hit bridge i mean there's a ships that hit amtrak bridges hit all these other things the question is is why did the entire bridge collapse yeah that's the yeah, question I mean, we should be down like a like a deck oh, of cards you like know a house deck of cards. cards like a bad lego oh, like something i built in lego right but it was horrible in the fact that just one ship took out an entire bridge. That should not be possible. That's a poor risk assessment that was done on that bridge. I mean, that, yeah. should, that bridge, if you would have said, hey, there's one thing on an airplane that if it fails, the airplane crashes. Would you fly on that airplane? No. It had to hit it at just a critical spot and the chances of it you know, doing that on per I don't know. There's rumors that that was even a cybersecurity hack. Oh, who knows? I yeah. mean, look, ships break all the time. Uh, large mechanical yeah. systems. I mean, I'm, I'm a big, you know, again, my, I love World War II Pacific, right? The Navy and, and, and the ships. Like, that's the Gambier Bay who was sunk by another, uh, the only aircraft carrier ever sunk by a Japanese surface ship. There are things that happen on these large, complex systems, right? Now, why did this large, complex system have all of its electrical fail? You know, twice, not once, but twice. Mm -hmm. I think that definitely is something that needs to be looked at for safety. Right. And that company needs to be held accountable for it. But I think the city of Philadelphia and whoever's responsible for the bridges need to go. Why did one hit on this bridge take out an entire bridge? Why is that possible? So it makes me think of the movie Leave the World Behind. I love talking about this movie. Have you seen it by chance? I did. I saw it. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts about it? Because it makes my mind race like I, I, it scared I me. I think there's always these systems where you're, you know, you're always afraid of, well, if one cyber attack can take out the whole country, is that possible? Are our interconnected lives that interconnected, right? I think if you understand cyber, the answer is probably no, right? Even the internet, even our technology is not that interconnected, right? But skip Pat said, that's not the point of the movie. The point of the movie is not a, a dissertation on, is it possible? The point of the movie is a dissertation on what would happen if, right? And I think the fact of it is absolutely, we have gotten to a certain point in our lives where we're so dependent on technology, it would be very hard. You know, when I went to basic training, you know, just a couple of years ago, not that long, but when I went to basic training a very long time ago, we didn't have the internet. The only thing I missed was being able to call people on the phone in my house, right? If I wanted to, and yeah, I had letters. My son went to basic training about, you know, what, five, six years ago. It was crippling not to have the internet on his phone and they were allowed to have them at a certain point. Like even the military is like, we can't disconnect them from the internet. It would be a very bad thing. But I think that is the question we have to ask ourselves is what happens if we just don't have technology? And the problem, the scary part that you get into is when you start getting into this concentration of risk. So for example, if I'm a business and I can have one computer run my entire business, would I do it? Absolutely, I would do it because it's cheaper, it's easier, it's, it's simpler. That's the way I'm going to do it. You're starting to see systems and it, it's going to take a lot longer than tomorrow, where especially now powered by things like AI and machine learning, where we can have these super systems start concentrating more and more and more risk of our company into a single decision making process. It is not hard to see 
And it doesn't take a fiction writer to see 50 years from now that could be a situation where leave the world behind is actually possible. So what would we do? And we always talk about the evil AI and stuff like that. It is not going to be the evil AI. It'll be the evil person who programs the AI, let's be clear. But right. it would be a certain situation in our future where we can get to a part where the concentration of risk is too much. When do we start forcing ourselves to not make it more efficient? Because there will be a point where we can. And the next thing you know, we're on the Battlestar Galactica, hopefully trying to run from the universe. <laughs> you know, because, you know I, I think, you know, that's a great line. If you think about AI or computers, it's a great line from the first Battlestar Galactica with Edward James almost when he's like, you know, there comes a day when you have to pay for the things you've done. And unfortunately, I don't know if we're paying for them yet. We do. We end up paying wars for things that we've done, right? Why, why did we have a second Iraq war? Because of the first Iraq war. Why did we have a second world war? Because of the first world war, right? You know what I mean? We always seem to make mistakes that come around and we pay kinetically. I think leave the world behind is a great thought to say, maybe there are some systems that should never be connected. You know, maybe the power system in our country doesn't need to be connected full on to the internet. Maybe that's an efficiency. We'll be okay with hiring a couple extra people to maintain. Maybe on that ship, right? Or ships, you know, maybe a whole ship can be run by AI, right? But should it be? Can an airplane fly itself? Oh, absolutely. Airplanes fly themselves all the time. They can take off. They can land themselves, too. But you still have two pilots, two very well-paid, very well-trained pilots on that airplane because we don't trust technology that much. Are we doing that elsewhere? Or are we saying, hey, you know what? If I have this system, I need three less cyber people. Really? Is that maybe the choice you should be making? You know, Need somebody to validate what's going on with the automation. Yeah, Talking about yeah. AI, are you using AI at all? Any tools? I think a lot of people do. I do it for research. I think it's fantastic for research. I think you've got to be careful with it. Right now, AI is not what we think it is, right? People go to Claude or they go to ChatGPT or they go to Copilot and they type in, or Copilot is ChatGPT, I'm sorry. They type in and they're like, Gemini. oh my gosh, this thing, this talk, Gemini, I'm sorry, yeah. Oh, Gemini, we're not talking about Gemini anyway. <laughs> Gemini has, you know, I think here's, and, and again, Gemini is a great example of the problem with AI. So if you have a child, right, we were both parents, right? You can teach your kid whatever you want. That kid is going to have its own opinions. If you come from a household that's backwards, that kid may grow up to be a scientist, right? You know, it, it's children make their own decisions. Yes, they're influenced by other people as they grow up. Absolutely, they're influenced by their surroundings, but they make their own decisions. They can choose to be president of the United States, right? You know, and Barack Obama went from one thing, he became president of the United States. There's a lot of great examples of that out there. AI doesn't have that. AI is not a human being. AI, we can go in there and tell it exactly how to think. That is the flaw of AI. And Jim and I, you saw that flaw where they were trying to do something for a good reason, and it ended up being a very bad thing that they created from it. That's our problem with it. We think we can tell AI how to think, and we don't realize all the causalities that are going to be caused by that. I think AI is a great tool right now for things like research and stuff, but don't have it write your papers. <laughs> I tell my students that all the time. AI has, is going to become a crutch. So let me give you an example. Do you navigate on your own anymore or do you use the phone in your car? Always pull up Google Maps. It's the phone. It's the phone all the time. Like I had to think about it the other day. I'm like, I don't even know if I have that in my brain anymore to remember how to actually navigate. Like I, I'll go someplace and I know I've been there 20 times, but I'm still using the map to get there, right? <laughs> because it's become a crutch. People who use AI as a crutch are about to find out that it doesn't work for them in real life. So I tell all my students, I, I teach in a master's program at Hallmark University, which is fantastic. University of is considering a master's degree. But I tell them all the time, you're not going to be able to use this in a meeting. And in a meeting is where you gain street cred. In a meeting is how you get promoted. In a meeting is where you gain gravitas in your position at your job. If you're a master's student, right, if you believe the master's degree, they expect you to be able to answer things in a meeting. If you had chat GPT write your paper, you're not doing it. You're not memorizing it. You're not learning it. That's not being embedded in your brain. When I did my doctorate, everything, there was no AI, there was no writing. It was Grammarly. It was about the closest we got to, I, I didn't remember where my prepositions were supposed to go, but I wrote every single paper and I remember every single paper to mostly, right? Or at least the gist of whatever I wrote at the time. Students who use AI to cheat and do stuff like that or authors who use AI to write, they're not learning the material. And it's very, very evident when you talk to them about it. Hey, I saw that you wrote this thing. Now, if you want to write some posts on LinkedIn, I think one of the great things that AI can do for, especially for a writer, is that, you know, for example, I'll outline my posts on LinkedIn and then I'll have it write it for me. But it's still my content. 
right? I'm just having right, yeah. AI put it in terms that you can understand because Blake would probably have a seizure trying to read my real writing on LinkedIn, <laughs> you know, if I didn't put it in a system like that. So I think there's definitely good and bad uses for it. I think the really good uses for AI come around analytics, right? Which is I have a huge data set, help me find the numbers, but you can't bet people's lives on that yet. It's not there. I've seen AI make just, you know, I, for example, one time I was like, uh, when I first started, I was like, I need some quotes from Gina Ramonetti, who used to be the CISO at IBM, right? I'm sorry, the, the president of IBM. I was like, hey, give me some quotes from Gina Ramonetti. And it did. They weren't real quotes. <laughs> you know what I mean? And that was my first like, oh, hey, wait, this is not going to work. You know what I mean? This is not, I'm going to have to. And, and again, I learned that the hard way to be very clear for it before I put it in a LinkedIn article. You know, I was going to use some quotes from her in a LinkedIn article. I was like, you know what? I'm going to have to do it the old fashioned way. And Google it, which, by the way, I don't. It's weird to say Google is the old-fashioned way, right? <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, it is, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, I heard if you add this is really important at the end of your prompt, then like the AI will make it a little better for you. Or something. <laughs> like, uh, you know, it depends on what what engine you're using. If you're using right. the paid model GPT four on ChatGPT, it does a little better, obviously. But but again, it's just there to please you. It's it's right. you know people think of of it as a book writing material or as an article writing material or as a paper writing thing, but it's not. What the AI we currently have is is conversational AI. It's just talking to you and it's trying to do what you th what it thinks you want to do. At the very end of the day, is AI some magical thing? No, it, especially when it comes to writing. Right, writing is a very programmatic machine kind of thing that we do. Right. And if you don't believe me, think back to your fourth grade grammar classes, right? You know what I mean? Like I before E, except sometimes after C, except in the English language where it just comes anywhere and you need to stop thinking that there are rules. But AI just uses rules, right? There's just a bunch of rules that it goes through to create it. But again, it's trying to make you happy. And I do teach AI in a lot of my classes and I, and I explained to them, it's, it's there to make you happy. Not always to be correct. There's a lot of use cases for it. I mean, you oh, know, no, I'm afraid all. of some of the pieces it might take out of the recruiting job function. When you say you have an AI driven recruiting tool or recruiting software now, that's that's just that's standard, oh, right? But everything's AI. Yeah. Everything's exactly. AI. Like uh, I'm surprised there's not like Snickers bars done by AI. Right? Right. Like, yeah. you know, AI Sorry. is the AI is the new it's new sticker. Right. New and improved sticker on every single thing out there, even though it's not really AI. Just curious. And this is just your opinion here. What do you speculate happened between OpenAI's board and Sam Altman behind the scenes? Oh, you know, when it comes to that kind of high level discussions with executives and sometimes it's just clearly personality. And, and especially if you have a startup, I think in this situation, these are probably people who have worked together for a very long time. Look at Elon Musk and PayPal, right? Look at the different things that have happened with some of these incredibly brilliant people and their boards of directors. It becomes personality driven. There's a great, I can't remember what the name of it was on the History Channel, but it was about the um, the car companies and how they all started, like Ford, Chevy, and Henry Ford's relationship with his board and how he talked to people versus the person who started GM, right? In his relationship with the board, he was a and I, and again I apologize I don't have the names, but he was a very hard personality to deal with. The guy who started GM and the board fired him. They ended up hiring him back later and firing him again. And it was very personality driven. I think that was most likely probably personality driven between the two different types of people. Based on my extreme lack of any serious knowledge of the subject, I would say you probably see these things become personality driven at a certain point in time. You're probably right. It's just, you know, a lot of speculations because the, the caginess about it is what worries me. It's like, oh, they must have discovered something that they're afraid oh. of. And there was yeah. a disagreement about how to handle it. Now they booted Sam and, you know, everybody revolted against that decision and brought him back. I mean, kudos to him for having over half the staff threaten to leave if they didn't hire him back. I mean, very few CEOs can say that. No, I, I think, well, and again, it depends on, you know, on the kind of, and, and again, not in a bad way, the cult of personality around the leader has with their employees, right? Look at Band of Brothers, right? That's a great TV show. Remember the one part where they decided to get rid of, you know, the one captain, every NCO is like, we're all going to quit at the same time, right? You know what I mean? They all went in there. I think you see that in situations where you have good leaders and maybe a, a board that didn't. I, I think we have a human nature. And it's kind of a human flaw sometimes where we may not have the information. And, and I learned this through research, especially going through the doctorate. It's okay not to have knowledge. Right. But humans, just out of our nature, we want to fill it with something that makes sense to us. We can't have gaps in our knowledge. So we don't know what happened between Sam Altman and the board. We probably never will know unless one of them writes a book. But I'm pretty sure they're all tied up in legal agreements where they will never be able to talk about it for a very long time. Right. Matter of fact, go out and try to get an interview with the former CISO of Equifax. 
it's not going to happen. You know what I mean? The garden leaf for the rest of her life, I'm sure. We just try to fill it in, right? It's, it's like, who built the pyramids? We don't know, but it had to be aliens. You know what I mean? So I, I think that's probably what it is. I think it was probably just personality driven between all of them. Although that doesn't sound like an exciting thing to talk about it. Here's the thing too. People think AI just started. But if you look back in the history of AI, it's been around a very long time, 50s and 60s, right? When we started huh. these kind of thinking. AI that you see today is not a new thing. It is built upon years of machine learning and other types of knowledge that we've had out there. What really kicked off this entire revolution was one that you could, anyone could go talk to, which was chat GPT. But again, has that AI or machine learning been around for a long time? Let me ask you this. Have you ever played a video game? Oh, yeah. Video games have been very good at machine learning you for a very long time. In some ways, like you play video games and you're like, oh my God, it's like you're playing a human. You know, it's very good. That's just another type of machine learning. We've had machine learning in our lives for a very long time, but machine learning, by the way, is not a cool catchphrase and it never had something you could go talk to online, right? ChatGPT did it all at the right time. Like why is Tesla popular? Everybody's made electric cars for a very long time. Talk to Toyota, you know what I mean? Chevy, Tesla did it at the right time with the right way and that's why they became popular, right? ChatGPT hit the market at the right time with the right product and it caught on like wildfire. And they didn't call it machine learning, they called it AI. And again, what does that do? That segues into every science fiction thing we've ever thought of. I mean, AI originally was thought of by science fiction writers in like the 1900s, you yeah, know? Mm -hmm. I mean, people yeah. look at the movie Dune and go, wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, that guy wrote it in the 50s. In the and 50s. what did they do with the AI in Dune? Oh, they so, destroyed yeah. them all. They made them well, completely illegal. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny too, yeah, because especially if you read the books, like, you know, it's funny. I'm such a nerd. I'm in there with my wife. I'm like, no, no, no. There's this thing called the Bahilarian Jihad and all these AIs. <laughs> Why you can't have thinking machines? Because, you know, the Dune universe looks so amazing, right? And it people does. Don't it because we can't have calculators. So we have people you know, who had this magical spice drug or whatever. Like, yeah, all written by a guy in the 50s. You got to listen to um, the guy that he's coined the godfather of ai but his name's jeffrey hinton and he's got a lot of stuff on youtube he's really interesting to chat with and i think you're probably right that it was just like personality clashes there's another podcast you should listen to rick rubin now, he's not a tech guy but he's got a podcast called tetragrammaton and he interviews a guy named mark anderson who is big in the startup community and vc investment firm of tech startups and i mean he says that's the biggest reason why these tech startups fail is because the leadership personality clashes. It's like a band that can't get along and they just fall apart. It's crazy. <laughs> well, you know, just because you're the smartest person in the room doesn't mean you're the best leader, yeah. right? You know what I mean? I've, I've had a lot of leaders in the military who I may have, you know, probably didn't think they were the most brilliant people, but I would have followed them to hell and back, right? You know what I mean? And just because their personalities were amazing. Do I believe Elon Musk is brilliant? Of course he is, right? I don't want to get sued by saying he's not. No, I'm just kidding. But, <laughs> you know, I think he absolutely is. But did Elon Musk create everything that we see? No, absolutely not. Steve Jobs was a brilliant person, but he didn't create the iPhone. It was teams of scientists and people and very smart people who did that for him. What Steve Jobs is, you know, sauce was he had learned from all the years of failure to become an actual somewhat, you know, good leader at Apple at the time, right? I think that that's what you see in a lot of cases. Sam Altman is probably a mixture of both, but that is a rare trait to have a person who can be the, the technical genius become the person who leads the company. We always give Mark Zuckerberg a lot of crap, but he also was one of those people who bridged that gap from being a technical person to a leader, right? You know what I mean? And there's just not very many of them out there. And sometimes maybe the board who got you there, who got you the funding, is not the people that need to see the company move on to the next one. And what you'll see in a lot of cases when you have an IPO is those people will just abandon ship anyway. They're there, they've, they've invested the money, they're representing the money. But once you have an IPO and that public goes stock and they've cashed out, it's a completely different group of people who come in to manage the company, usually that you see. Yeah. Hey, what are your go-to sources of information? I know you do a, re a lot of research with AI, but are there any specific websites or thought leaders or podcasts that you like to listen to? Most of them all over on LinkedIn. You know, I, I think LinkedIn is great to find out. It, I, I think the one problem with LinkedIn is that the more popular you are in LinkedIn, and, and I mean it as in like, you know, the CISO of Bank of America or, you know, Brett Whalen, CISO of Activision right, is a really good one that's on there. But I think in a lot of cases that you'll see sometimes is the people who are really, really popular and really, you know, out there like very, very famous actually don't do their own LinkedIn or they don't have time to do their own LinkedIn. I like to see people who are actual like CISOs of like 
like Brett Whalen, you know, Will Bennett, all these other people who post their own stuff on there who are very busy people and, and you get to. I, I think that's a great source. Um, other than that, I just do the typical, you know, different news sites like Dark Reading. You know, I still love Bleeping Computer, even though, <laughs> you know, I get some of those stuff out there. Um, honestly, Krebs. You know, I, I, if you ask me who the one person I would probably pay attention more than anybody else in cybersecurity, it's, it's Krebs. Right. You know, what I mean, I, I think he is, you know, his background as a journalist and everything. You know, and this is another thing. I always use him as an example to my students because he did not have a degree in cybersecurity. His degree is in international relations. And he is probably the most famous cybersecurity investigative journalist that exists today. And he's probably the most trusted one that's out there and did not have a degree in cybersecurity. So a lot of those people who are thinking they can change from one job to another. It's a great example for you. Gives me some hope that I can. <laughs> Focus in this area because, you know, I, I do a lot of recruiting in the yeah. cybersecurity world, but among a lot of other skill sets, I mean, right now I'm not turning down any jobs. Honestly, I work on anything. <laughs> yeah, I do gravitate towards the cybersecurity community. I look around at my friends group and I'm like, wow, OK, he's a firewall engineer. We got a cybersecurity engineer over here. We got a GRC guy. A lot of them are in the cyber world and i get along with them the best so i'm like okay maybe these are my people <laughs> yeah and you i know, do like, like filling the jobs the other thing too is i, I will tell people is you got to be more rounded right and and that and this is mostly in my case and other people too i i found some people will focus 100 percent. so i you know i was talking to a couple of folks at a lunch a while back and they're like yeah you know i listen to this podcast every day in the car i listen to this podcast every day in the car i listen to this audiobook in the car and they're like what do you listen to and i'm like well currently it's a book about giant robots that battle each other in the 23rd century. I was like, I can't listen to cyber in the car most of the time because it, it doesn't distract me enough from the commute between here and Austin, which is the worst on the planet. I think, you know, what I call it is you got to cleanse your palate a lot of times. You know, you can't overly focus on something because you lose perspective. It is OK to read fiction. One of the best people I've ever worked for, Will Bennett, the CISO of USA, right? You know, he always has a problem because he is he's one of those people that's just on all the time. And I always told him, a, you know, I was like, the only reason I survive is because sometimes I listen to stories about giant robots. Or right now I'm listening to a history of the USS Enterprise from World War II. You know what I mean? And it, it's definitely not cyber or the Tin Can Sailors by James Hornfisher or something like that. You know, something that's out of what I do on a daily basis is the only way to get my brain to be creative when it comes to doing the daily business sometimes. I say to people, it's great. Definitely listen to podcasts, especially this one, you know, or, or, or watch videos and do that other stuff. But you have to have a timeout for your brain, right? I will tell you, my daughters are not interested in what I do for a living. So I force myself when I'm them to talk about what they do, right? You know, spend time with your family. I mean, you're always going to hear these things out there. You know, your job will replace you. Your family can't, you know. I think it's okay to focus on a lot of stuff that is cybersecurity, but you got to become well-rounded. You can't be that one person who only knows how to talk about cybersecurity because as you move up in leadership, the one thing people forget about cybersecurity is your peers will not be in cyber, right? And I think that's one of the lessons I learned from Will over at USA is that his peers weren't cybersecurity. His peers were insurance people and banking people. So you need to know how to talk insurance and banking. You know, I think Sunil Punjabi, let's go back to um, Argo. I was asked, I was like, why don't you have a master's in IT? Why do you have an MBA? And he's like, because my peers aren't masters in IT, they're all MBA. He goes, and sometimes it's better to know what they know. You know, for everybody out there who's thinking like that, think about the fact that you have to talk to business people. If that gets you ahead, then learn that as well. Interesting take on that. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, it's good to be well-rounded in everything, but you don't want to be a one-trick pony, right? Well, sometimes um, it's hard, right? You <laughs> love a subject so much, it's hard to unfocus yourself on it, but you got to do it. Yeah, yeah. Well, they say, especially when you're doing content or... You know, if you're in recruiting, you have to specialize in something. You have to be the expert in the one thing that you can be known for. And, ah, you know, I really hate that because people gravitate towards a variety of things. I mean, if you're going to talk about the same thing every day, you got to be able to shake things up a little bit and explore other interests. And I have a very hard time just being niched into one thing because I like a lot of different things. And I feel like when you choose one area to focus in, you eliminate the possibility to be considered for other areas. And then you, know, you never know what you're closing yourself off from. So yeah, I don't know. I'm kind of torn over it. I learned this a long time ago as a lieutenant in the army when I became a second lieutenant on tanks. And I looked at the tank as this giant mechanical system that I could learn. And then there I have a platoon sergeant who has 15, 16 years in the military, right? Who has 15 years of dealing with this subject. And I'm like, I'm never going to learn that. 
I, I can't outlearn this human being who has spent 15 years living in this environment. I can't outlearn that. So maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I should focus on what I need to know, which is tactics, right? Which is not something that person has learned maybe as much as what I need to know or how to do it. So you have to think about it that way. If I had a cybersecurity recruiter, I would not expect them to know how Python works. I think that's absurd. What I need them to know is how to be a good recruiter and to at least have a conversation about cybersecurity when it comes to this job skills, right? I just have a natural distrust for anybody who has 27 certifications and thinks they know everything else in the world, right? We, we don't like know-it-alls. It's just a human nature kind of thing. I think it's good to be well-rounded in a lot of conversational topics at a dinner party versus I can be an expert on everything you do. Yeah, I always I shy away from the candidates so that you see that their profile is just stacked with certification after cert. They're certified in everything. I'm like, they don't ever actually work. All they, I mean, they just spend all their time getting certifications. That's it. Well, I think also you look at that and you're like, okay, that person's good at test taking. <laughs> right, taking you know, that. Yeah. I, you know, it, but the other thing too is I think that person has a problem of focusing. <laughs> you know, um, I, I think that the problem that you run into, and this goes back to the original discussion we had about remote versus local, right? Well, locally, there's only a job for a GRC person who knows Archer, RSA Archer. Well, I don't know RSA Archer, but I'm going to have to tell him I know RSA Archer because I need a job. Right. And I'm going to learn RSA Archer. I think that's the problem you get into. Whereas if I'm looking out in the whole country, I can find a person who's had four jobs in RSA Archer. And maybe that's the person I want to hire from. Right. Whereas my job as being more of a GRC generalist or whatever would be good for this job in North Carolina. But I just can't move there. Right. I, I think that's the other problem. And, and, and fortunately, it's, you know, how big do goldfish grow? As big as their environment. Right. And I think that's that's another problem that we run into with this. You know, I, I think if you see people with a lot of certifications, either one, they've had a lot of jobs or they needed them and they just don't want to get rid of them or they don't know what they're going to do. And they're trying to say that they're an expert in all these different things. Right. I, I think that's OK for a pre-sales engineer. Right. Versus different from a person you'd expect to have 20 years in cyber. What are you most excited about in the near future of cybersecurity? I think NIST 2.0 is out. <laughs> I'm currently writing a book on it. That's kind of my current excitement. Okay. I, I, you know, and it's weird as a governance person, right? As a compliance, risk compliance person, we normally look for things that rationalize our lives, right? GRC is all about rationalization, right? So for example, how do you make this entire complex environment work? How do you orchestrate that? That's what my love of cybersecurity is. It's not, hey, could I learn pen testing? I know I could. I could learn it, right? Am I going to be the best ever at it than a person who's doing for 15 years? No. But what I like the idea of is going, where does pen testing fit into an overall organizational complex, right? NIST was always one of my favorites, right? All the way back in the military when you used to do DIACAP, right? So NIST was created because everybody in the U.S. government had a different way of doing cyber, right? Military had DIACAP. We had all these other kind of crazy things that we did. So when NIST came out, it was really amazing. The problem with NIST was, and if you used it for years and years and years, it was hard to find out where things went, right? Because NIST was like, they, they were purposely obtuse on this timing-based framework where, you know, identify, for example, had to have everything in there like policies and all this. Well, it didn't make sense, right? So the new NIST comes out, they actually created a governance portion of it for everybody in my career field was like, that makes so much complete sense. And so I'm kind of excited with it, reading through it. I'm writing a book on it and teaching controls about it. So one thing I, I think is interesting too in a lot of jobs is people don't understand how controls work. And you have different types of controls. You have this panacea of the word control where it's, you know, hey, it's a control. Cybersecurity is a control for risk, right? Versus all the way down to a quantifiable test in a bank, right? So one thing I'm doing in a book that I'm writing for Wiley on NIST 2.0 and I know this is weird to say I'm excited about NIST 2.0, but it's my thing, right? You know, there's NIST 800-53 people that are out there, right? The government, stuff like that. And then there's the rest of us, right? We want to use NIST. Like you see companies out there who want to use NIST. What is the, the you must be this tall to ride requirement? On NIST, it's pretty dang high. You've got to understand a lot of things about NIST in order to say I'm a NIST organized company, right? So what I'm trying to do in this book for Wiley is take all that hardness away. So for example, for every NIST subcategory, I have a couple pages just in human terms explaining what it means. So if you want this category, if you want to say, hey, I'm going to follow this category, this is what you really kind of have to do. And then I add, hey, here's the NIST 53 controls. But then after that, I actually create three simple controls that anybody can do, right? I call them like simplified security controls. For example, when I was at that energy company at Brace, we're a $100, $150 million business, right? Difference between that and USAA, which is a quarter of a trillion dollar business, 90% of our businesses are brace level businesses or below, SNEs, right? Small, medium enterprises. So I wanted to create things at a small to medium enterprise. I'm the IT slash cyber person. You know, we call them IT managers or IT directors, right? I'm, I'm that person for this company. How can I become secure? 
Well, good, I got three human written things here that are very simple for you to follow and implement in your company. And you can say that, yeah, you follow NIST now. I'm pretty excited that that just came out. I think organizationally, I, you know, the only thing I would say is, you know, my challenges in the future is it's still gonna be legal and regulation. You know, people always talk about, you always hear this, especially politics, like, good Lord, we have a presidential election coming, people. So you're gonna hear all the bad things about regulation, but there are good things about regulation. Right. You don't want your banks failing. Right. You don't want, you know, people having bad food. You know, we always talk about, you know, regulation and red tape is a bad thing. And I think in a certain extent it can be. You know, the bureaucracy can become too much of a bureaucracy. But I think the good thing about it is that the United States, even with a lack of laws, has a good regulatory framework on how to handle most businesses. Right. I think we can argue around the edges of whether or not a, a fisherman in the Northeast needs to pay for a guy to come out and inspect his crab nets or whatever. That's the whole Chevron argument with the Supreme Court. And I think that's good. I think the challenge, of course, is going to be the fact that our Congress doesn't write laws anymore. You know, they pass spending bills and they attach things to spending bills. And it's become this habit over the past 20 years where Congress can't pass anything really important. You know, we, we tried to do health care and I don't think we really succeeded in that, right? One way or the other. We tried to do immigration. We didn't really succeed in that at all. Congress doesn't try to pass things that work anymore. They try to pass things that'll pass. And so cybersecurity has been one of those areas where we've been lacking. So, and I always ask my students this, I'm like, when was the last criminal cybersecurity law ever passed? 1985, hmm. the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. It was uh, in response to the movie War Games. When the movie War Games came out, the Reagan administration said, wait, is that legal? And the answer was yes, because we don't have a law saying it's not legal. And so the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act was created in 1985 for that reason. It's the last one. It is the last law that we created for criminality in this country around cybersecurity. And we don't see one happening. Like, for example, why do we not have a European style privacy regulation? Good we just question. Can't. We cannot. So what we have is 50 states privacy regulations. Some of them are very good, like California, right? And then some of them are not so good, which I won't reference, right? But the problem is, is that depending on where you are in this country, you now have a patchwork of that. For a GRC person, <laughs> hey, this is my future. Thank you. Thank you, the U.S. government, for securing my future, because no one's going to understand any of this without me. But bad news, of course, is that for businesses out there, it makes it very difficult. So one thing I try to do in the books I've written, and especially the one coming up on NIST, and another one on CIS 18, by the way, is that how can you say you're CIS 18 or you're NIST and do it in a simple way at a business with only one or two people in your IT department? This is how you can do it. I'm sure a lot of people will appreciate that. I guess it's like NIST 2.0 for dummies, right? Maybe you should try to <laughs> coin that, right? Uh, I'm pretty sure that one was taken. Wiley, I love my <laughs> publisher, Wiley. They're such a very, you know, big company and stuff. You know, they're, they're, they're kind of like, eh, I think this would sell better, Jason. <laughs> and as an author, <laughs> you would be stupid not to listen to your publisher on these things, right? Well, I can't wait for it to come out. We'll have to have you back. We'll, let's do a launch party for you whenever yeah, you have it out. Yeah, yeah, I'd love to help promote that with you. I've really enjoyed talking with you. This has been fun. I feel like we could just go on and on. So yeah, I'd love to have you back if uh, if you enjoyed it, man. I, I really appreciate your time. Well, my wife would agree with you on the I can go on and on part. <laughs> so, <laughs> way past the point of when I should have probably shut up. But no, I think it's awesome, especially get to talk to other people with occasional Star Wars. Right? Again, I'll just say one more thing, you know, for people out there who you know, I, I always let people meet them and they're like, yeah, I'm not into Star Wars. I'm like, what? You hate people? <laughs> like you dislike other people? Right. Like, because the greatest thing about Star Wars is that they're all different kinds of fans. Right. You know what I mean? And, and, and we have something for everyone in Star Wars. Right. I don't care who you are. Like I said, I was in a KFC with two complete strangers and I'm like, hey, you love that, too. I love Solo. You know right. what I mean? And like, boom, we're friends. Are we friends? Yeah, Best we're friends. friends. You know, and, and it's, it's amazing how Star Wars and like pretty much you now. I, I will tell you, I love Star Trek as well, but Star Trek starts fights. <laughs> Star <laughs> Trek is not the same. You're like, what do you mean you prefer, you know, that over Enterprise? What's wrong with you? You know, like Star, Star Trek starts fights. It's a great community. Don't get me wrong. But Star Wars <laughs> is so vast. You just make friends with people everywhere. And you can agree to disagree. You know what I mean? Like, oh, I like Boba Fett. Well, I thought the only good part about Boba Fett was the Mandalorian episode. <laughs> so, you know, like, but you can all get along. Like, that's probably the most disagreement we'll ever have is whether we like Boba Fett or not. <laughs> so, Agreed. Yeah. I'm glad Star Wars has brought us together, at least. We could definitely start, like, just a Star Wars-focused commentary <laughs> I think two people who didn't speak their own languages could use it as a Rosetta Stone. Stormtrooper, <laughs> Stormtrooper. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
Oh, that's how you say Stormtrooper. I can build a language just from two people who love Star Wars, right? So, yeah. <laughs> Well, hopefully the Acolyte will be good. I can't wait for it to come out. I think it's in June or something like that. So I'll be there watching that. And, you oh, know, I just wish there was something to watch. Uh, like some form of Star Wars content, either animated or live action or whatever. Just a continuous drip of new content. I mean, they just need to get in the rhythm. They might as well. And I know I'm stuck in this unholy thing where, okay, Halo ended. Now I got to watch Bad Batch. Then hopefully <laughs> Acolyte will come out. And then what's after that? Oh, Star Trek New Horizons. Hopefully we'll have a new season <laughs> right. sometime this year, right? So you're in like, you get into like six shows accidentally. I swore to God I would never do this after Breaking Bad, right? I was like, no, no, no. I'm going to binge watch everything when they're done. Now I'm like, but I can't because there'll be a spoiler about the Acolyte. So I got to watch it every week. Right? Right. It's going to ruin right. it for me. <laughs> see died i'm like no you know what so, yeah, ah. yeah gotta watch that on launch nights and honestly that's the one thing i love to do with my youngest daughter is we watch star wars on, on opening nights right so yeah oh yeah did you see rebel moon i did i can't believe they didn't let that be a star wars movie because i'm like yeah i can totally see this as a star wars movie <laughs> but yeah right on. yeah i thought it was really well done I, I think rebel moon and other people you know they get into these things like well but this and that you know like um I was in a movie theater a long time ago watching Transformers 4, the Chicago one, where they blew up Chicago. There was a couple next to me, and the one comment they had was, I can't believe she's wearing those shoes and running. There's no way you can do that. And I'm like, I'm thinking, I'm like, wait, did you miss the giant robots taking over Chicago? And that's the most <laughs> unrealistic thing you call out of this movie? Like, like, Michael Bay, congratulations, man. The only thing people thought out of this is Rosie Hunting Whitley should have had different shoes on in this whole thing. I think people miss that a lot. Like, And I saw a couple comments about Rebel Moon like that, and I'm like, I did not see that. I think it's a great movie. I thought it was it's a strong lead female character, right? That wasn't like, you know, it wasn't toned down at all. It was a it was a very much toned up movie and I can't wait for part 2. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. And like there's haters, man. There's haters for everything, Always. especially on the YouTube commentators. And you kind of can take a little comfort in knowing that no matter what you do, somebody's going to hate it and other people are going to love it. Don't worry about it. One of my favorite quotes is even if 99% of the population of Earth hated your guts, that would still leave over 70 million people who yeah. really liked you. <laughs> More people than you could ever meet in your real right. life. Right, exactly. And yeah. Honestly, you people always think about that too, but like, who do you need to appreciate the things you do? It's a very small oh, number. Man. It's a very it small really number. Is. Your boss, your wife, your kids. It really, outside of that, you're just extra degrees of... You know, like, you know, James Horner in Desert Storm, he was the air boss for Desert Storm that, that he created a thing called Circles of Influence. Right. And so what he did is when he targeted the and this is a weird military thing coming out of my brain, but it's a book up here somewhere. Into the storm <laughs> called. But anyway, he, he created what's called Circles of Influence. Right. So if I hit something in here and what level of importance it is like a dartboard, Saddam Hussein's right there in the middle. Right. And other people, other people out there in your life, who are your circles of influence? Right. Just because some random coworker says something to you about something you wrote, don't take that to heart and ruin your entire day or weekend for it. Don't go home and be grouchy with the kids because that person is in the fifth circle of influence in your life, right? It's the ones in the middle that make a difference to you, right? Your family is circle number one. The people who pay your bills are number two, right? That person or, or that person at a restaurant who made a comment about my wife's jacket I don't care about that person. Like if, if, if that's what you do for a living, man, good luck with your life, right? Don't ruin your day because someone in, the, in, in an outside of your circle of influence that you care about made a comment or tried to do something to ruin your day. You know, that's like getting mad at people in traffic. It's not useful. That person, you know, I cut somebody off. They hate me. Now I'm going to feel bad about it all day. Why? Because you're the only person who ever cut anybody off in traffic in San Antonio. <laughs> Not even today, man. Not even that hour. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah. perspective, right? I think what you said there about 99% is true. Perspective. Yeah, it is a life hack. Don't take anything personal. Nothing. And then, you know, I guess you're having a bad day. I'm, you know, sorry about that. Is everything all right? <laughs> I, had a, I had a great uh, instructor. They were teaching us about PTSD after we got out, right? And so one of the things they said is that, and it always stuck with me, is no one can reach in your brain and change the way you think. If you feel bad about something, you're doing it to yourself, right? If some person tried to make you feel bad, they're trying to influence the way you think. They can't change the way you think. You do that, right? right. No one can reach in your brain and tell you. I think if you ask me of all human beings, the most amazing people ever lived was Mother Teresa. 
by far, not even close, right? Look at that woman's history and what she did. And I'm sure she got tons of flack over her entire life. And she was probably the most beautiful person that ever existed. Think about that. No one can change the way you think. The sheer unwillingness of people that she had to deal with in her life, right? And, and the adversity she dealt with in her life. And she never changed the way she thought. Like that woman was a saint, I think, but when she was born to the day she died. And no one, she never let anything change her. That's just how you got to be. And it's hard. Look, we're all human. It's going to happen. Someone's going to make me feel bad tomorrow. I'm going to feel bad for a little bit. Then I'll think about it. Like maybe I should. Yeah. Yeah. Just brush it off as quick as you can. Well, this has been fun, man. I feel like I've Thank you. keeping you too long here, man. I really enjoyed it. Thank you for coming on. This is uh podcast number three. I mean, Congrats. so yeah, it's still <laughs> early, but yeah, we're going to try to get some good clips out of it and I'll send them to you. I hope you share them and maybe you'll get something good out of it as yeah. well. So, well, uh, and, if, and, and again, let me know if they go on LinkedIn. I don't always see people's posts, but if you tag me on it, I'll make sure that I, I reshare it onto my network as well. Cause it'd be awesome. Perfect. Yeah. Like subscribe, follow, comment, all the things, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Help Absolutely. us out people. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So all awesome. right. Well, thank well, you, th Blake. You're very welcome, day. sir. My pleasure. Thank you, Jason. All right. Bye. Cheers.